All right, the Building Operators Association has, since September, uh, had our meetings being virtual. We are not allowed to meet in, in because of this pandemic. And so we have had a, on each of our meetings a guest speaker. And the topic we have been focusing on has been the coronavirus. It seems to be prevalent in our industry and we want to make sure that what we present to you is, is focused on education and giving the best that we possibly can. Uh, since we've entered out this into this lockdown and because of the coronavirus, we've all heard a lot of information with regards to it. Uh, with some of that information has been good information and some of it has been misinformation. So it's pretty hard to sometimes separate the good from the bad. So the Building Operators Association in these education virtual meetings and, and webinars have tried to distill it down to the stuff that's most important and the stuff that we believe that is true. Uh, these rumors and speculation and misinformation is prevalent. So that we've tried to present these fact-based information using sources such as ASHRAE, in uh, Health Canada, and uh, BOMA to present what we believe to be the best possible information. Uh, we want to uh, hear from our guest speakers and so uh, the one that we have brought for you today is Kurt Belamontang uh, from C5+. Plus. Kurt has been involved in indoor air quality since 1908. He's consulted both in Canada as well as in the USA and his focus has been uh, high-rise office towers looking at indoor environmental quality management. He currently, Kurt is currently working in Calgary, uh, his company C5 Plus, and, and he has excelled in software development, focus on commercial environment, and Kurt is a valued member of the BOMA Best team here in Calgary. Uh, Kurt holds an honors degree in philosophy at the University of Calgary and is a graduate of strategic management from the University of Cal California out of San Diego. So today, Kurt will be focusing on well-established, credible sources, uh, such as uh, principles set forward and supported by organizations such as ASHRAE, Health Canada, and BOMA. Uh, so BOA Calgary, this webinar series for January is pleased to present Kurt Lamontang of C5+. Plus. Thank you, Kurt. And thank you, Les. I pretty much covered it. I don't have much left to say now. Wow, gosh. <clears throat> Anyhow, as Les was just saying, and I want to uh, emphasize this, the reason for this particular webinar is because we're seeing just an immense amount of information out there with respect to IAQ during the pandemic. And a lot of it's pretty questionable at best. But even a lot of the good information is just getting overwhelming. It's coming from multiple sources and slightly different interpretations. And so the message I'm trying to get across with this is let's just calm down and get back to the basics. So I'm not going to go into a deep technical dive on this, but I'm going to focus on things that you guys as building operations professionals probably already understand and should be completely focused on just to make sure everything's happening as it should be. And then we can look at some of the other stuff. So what I'm going to talk about very quickly, I'm going to do a quick recap of IAQ and COVID-19, how they relate, talk a bit about the legal and other risks, which is a little hair raising, talk about credible sources, a little bit about innovation and you know what's silver bullets and what's snake oil. And the answer is no silver bullets and lots of snake oil. And then a, hopefully a, a good Q&A discussion. So just because of who I am and the way I tend to do these things, <clears throat> I always like to reward people for coming to these things on their own time uh, by giving a quick snap quiz. Don't worry, you don't actually have to answer these questions, but ASHRAE 62.1 2019, which is the ventilation standard, what do, is the recommended level of CO2 in office spaces in that version? Dun, 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 dun. There is no such recommendation and there never has been. And this is a myth that's floating around, but it's important to realize that ASHRAE 62.1 talks about ventilation rates, not CO2 levels. They have up until 2019 given a reference how you can use CO2 levels to derive ventilation rates if you do it properly. My suspicion is by the way, they stopped even doing that in 2019 because nobody ever does it properly. Next step, 
what's the recommended level of ventilation then, if that's what they're talking about in office spaces for dealing with airborne contaminants? You should also know these are always trick questions. <laughs> they don't. It's not based on anything except odor control. You know that reading the 2019 version, but if you look at the historical versions, especially even as recently as 2016 and 2013, they explicitly state in the standard that it's only to, it's a minimum amount of ventilation to keep odors under control. And the test for that, by the way, is that only one person out of five coming into your office space is offended by the smells in the first 15 seconds. Let that sink in for a second. The ventilation standard in a high rise office tower in downtown Calgary, according to ASHRAE, says one out of five people can be offended by the odors in the space when they walk in. That's probably not what you want to be doing during a pandemic. And it's also worth pointing out that ASHRAE specifically states that this standard does not take into account other contaminants such as radon, such as fungi, such as viruses. So again, if anybody's telling you to meet the ASHRAE standard during a pandemic, they don't understand what ASHRAE is trying to uh, solve with this. Now, ASHRAE does have a pandemic response, which is quite a bit different and makes a lot more sense. So there's an old, <clears throat> there's an old saw about if you're going to do a class, you're going to teach something or have a seminar, what you do is you tell people what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. So I thought I'd just cut out the middleman and tell you, this is what I'm asking you to remember. This is what I'm trying to tell you during this webinar. And that is, here's three things as building operations you should be focused on to keep your buildings very healthy during a pandemic, this particular pandemic. And in order, you want to supply as much fresh air as you possibly can within the limitations, of course, of your building systems. You want to filter that air as much as you can, hopefully MERV 13 or better, as long as you don't actually impact the supply of fresh air. And then the third one, which isn't as important, but is still important, is try to keep the humidity between 40 and 60%, as close up to 60 as you can get it. And again, be aware in Calgary or Edmonton, Alberta in the winter, the odds of being able to do that are pretty close to zero. Don't damage your buildings based on best practice standards. You do the best you can within the context of what your building systems can handle. So let's talk very quickly about the definition of what IAQ is. This is important. Definition, airborne contaminants affecting the health or comfort of building occupants. And that comes in, either it comes in from outside, it comes from the building materials in your building, off-gassing, what have you, or it's coming from occupants and visitors. And pretty obviously for COVID-19, for the coronavirus, it's the occupants and visitors we're most concerned with. And then secondary comfort factors. But the point here is that this is not a sustainability issue, indoor air quality. It's a health and safety issue. So let's talk briefly about what are we talking about here? So external contaminants that can come in. Obviously, you guys are mostly familiar with this. But the main concern we have, of course, is viruses, the microbiologicals. We're not all that concerned about those things coming in through your ventilation. And, and we'll get into that a little bit later why. But it's important to realize that that can happen. We are not concerned at all with your building materials in terms of the, the pandemic. You're not going to get the virus actually coming out of your building materials. You may get them. Somebody put, puts them onto your building materials and then they pass that way through what's called fomite transmission. But the big one we want to talk about is the occupants. You get a, somebody in there who's non-symptomatic but infected and that's the thing you want to be focused on. How do you control this? So in that context, let's think about how COVID-19 is transmitted. There's no dispute about this first one at all. Never has been. Don't expect ever will be. The number one method of mechanism of transmission is heavy droplets in the air for a very short time from sneezing, coughing, talking, etc. And a lot of you maybe remember earlier on people were advising you that you didn't have to worry. This is really mostly what you had to worry about. Well, you still want to worry about this. The secondary source is what's called surface or fomite transmission. You know, somebody sneezes or contaminates, puts their hands down, somebody picks it up, say from an elevator switch. That's why the focus on cleaning. 
And by the way, although it's still important to bear this in mind, it turns out that the fomite transmission isn't nearly as bad as we thought it might have been. That doesn't mean it's not still something you need to be concerned with. You do. But the big change since the beginning is that this third mechanism are tiny droplets, or what we call aerosolized droplets or aerosols in the air, and they can hang out for a long time and spread really easily, again, from the same source as the heavy droplets, right? So this is where you think about what we're just talking about with indoor air quality. Now, this is how it transmits. It's pretty clear that the quality of the air is going to be critical for managing the risks here. So where is it most dangerous? Indoors, high density, lots of people, poorly ventilated spaces where it's dry and cool. That is a recipe for a super spreader event if you get a bunch of people in that kind of environment. So what do you want to do? Number one, and for those of you who know me, nothing new here, ventilate more. Even when we're not talking about during a pandemic, that's always a good idea. But at this point, you really want to ventilate to the extent you can. And don't just focus on air changes per hour or CFM per occupant. You want to focus, you want to make sure both of those are getting dealt with. And the reason is the air changes per hour is how you know that you're cycling through and filtering and getting rid of any viruses that might be in the space. The per occupant says if you have a, a high density space or if you have a higher density, then you're going to make sure that you have enough fresh air going to every person. And, and we don't have time to dive into the exact um, risk factors involved in this, but you want to make sure that you make you may get enough air for every occupant. And you can't do that based simply on air changes per hour. Because if you think about it, think about a low density space with four air changes an hour and a high density space with uh, four air changes per hour, the amount of fresh air getting to each occupant is dramatically different. Again, to reemphasize, the ASHRAE 62.1 ventilation minimums are not sufficient for a pandemic. If somebody's telling you to just meet the ASHRAE minimums, that is wrong. That is not sufficient. According to ASHRAE, that's not sufficient. And Try not to accept sustainability trade-offs to save the um, on saving energy. Understand, you know, the financial constraints. That's something you may not be able to avoid. But absolutely, do not let somebody argue that you need to be worried about CO2 gases, you know, down the road from uh, the energy costs of ventilating during a pandemic. For me, this is like somebody's brought into the ICU with a massive heart attack. And instead of you know getting their heart working again, you're going, you really need to eat more vegetables, fresh carrots, that's the ticket. Get your priorities straight. Once you ventilate, oh, and again, to recap, ventilate to the extent you can. Don't overload your systems, don't break your systems, please. To the extent you can, you want to filter as much as you can. And if you're in a building that has compartment fans, you want to be filtering both in the primary air handling units and in those compartment fans, MERV 13 plus, if you can, without affecting the efficiency of your system. Again, don't, tr and also don't put so much filtration in place, which has been happening, by the way, where you end up uh, getting way too much pressure drop and you end up with less ventilation to get higher efficiency filtration. If you got to decide between filtration and ventilation, you should bias towards more ventilation. Ideally, you've got both, of course. And then finally, humidify to the extent you can. Be aware that if you're trying to humidify in January in downtown Calgary uh, at 40 to 60% relative humidity, you are going to create another hazard. You're going to get moisture in your building envelope. You're going to create an environment for fungi and um, bacteria. And potentially, you could even damage your building envelope if that moisture, you know, basically gets out there and then freezes and thaws and freezes and thaws. So again, do what you can within reason. By the way, we should be done, Les. We are. I had a question there. And sure. that is that uh, when we bring our humidity up to a higher level and the bacteria can, or the virus can ride on the smaller uh, particles of moisture, would that also be small enough to enter in and ride on the humidity humidity that we put into the tower? I wouldn't think so. Let me think about that for a second. I haven't actually had that question asked before. Because it does ride on the, because it can't exist, it only rides and is delivered by small water droplets, which is in the air, humidity. Well, 
it's not entirely water droplets. It's any sort of particulate, mm -hmm. including water droplets. A lot of times it'll be dried out. It's just hitching a ride on dust or whatever. Yes. Yeah. I wonder but if you, but your mean. point, if you're actually uh, putting droplets into the air, and we are in some cases. And you are in some cases, then can it ride along with that? And I guess the answer, and I'm just thinking about this now, I have to say, I, I think I would say, I think it makes sense that could happen, but it's probably still going to be a lower risk because we know that the higher humidity makes for a less viable environment for it. All right. And again, if you're talking about, you know, Ha having that happen during when you're doing these other things, filtering and ventilating, yeah. it's probably going to override it. But no, that's a really good question. Yeah, well, be, I, you know, if, if you, it, we'll try, try to try and track that down and find out. Uh, we've talked a lot about filtration over the last four or five months, and we found that uh, the people that do supply the filters noted that when they were typically running a MERV uh, seven or eight on the compartment units, the, you know, the circulation, the internal circulation on the fans, and they stepped them up to a 13 filter. They didn't notice a large draw on the amperage of the motors or a, a big reduction on the ventilation that air traveling through the ducting. So even though the, we do believe that it, it does draw a little bit, it's not that significant. So. No, okay. and the only thing I would add to that though, is that you almost want to go beyond MERV 13 to the extent you can without affecting that. And that's going to be dependent on every system. You yeah. Can that recommendation. Sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right. If you can go up to a, I don't know if you could draw as, so much as a HEPA filter across it, but. Uh, that, that ain't happening. That would not happen. But 13 is 85% particle containment of one micron or less, you know, which well, is. The, the nice thing about MERV 13 too, is when you're combining it with like the air changes and normal yeah. density. I'm trying to, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it means that you're basically, you can essentially clear the space, I think in three air changes, if you're not putting new stuff in. Yeah. You're, you're down to the point where if you have particulates, you're gonna have pulled out, you know, 99.9% .9 of them at that point. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So, you know, if we look at, at, at the typical compartment units, uh, where they typically it is doing six changes an hour, one change of that every hour is fresh air, rated at about 18% yeah. uh, dilution rates and keeping it positive. So we probably have 17% uh, leaving and 18% coming in, so we have a positive pressure. So it's still a pretty good exchange of air one time out of every hour. Well, and the other nice thing is that what I've seen in our buildings, which admittedly are not a general case. They're skyscrapers. That's all we work in pretty much. But we're getting effectively MERV 15 level by having the primary air handling units and the compartment fans both having MERV 13 on them. Sure. MERV 15 is pretty freaking good. It is. And, you know, they're not having big issues, as you say, with, um, you know, higher energy. They're not having big issues. It's really the, their main increase in the cost is just the cost of the filters for the compartment units. Yeah, and, and when I listen to some of the programs from Health Canada, when you're exposed to the virus, if you get if you have one particulate of, or one virus hit you, it's not really going to affect you. It's when you inundated with it. Yeah. So if, you know, if somebody sits right beside you and sneezes, and you catch the full weight of their sneeze, it, it, then you've gotten, you, you know, you've been contaminated multiple times by one knot. You know, yeah, that, you're, you're never going to get sick from one virus or one no. germ of any kind. Yeah. The other interesting thing about this, and this is a little unusual, at least to me, is that it looks like the even if you do get an infection, it seems to be directly related to the dosage and exposure you got the infection at the time. So even if you, you know, you, you get overwhelmed, but you get a small dosage and you're more likely to have mild symptoms than somebody who's like, oh, I don't know, trapped in a church basement with the choir for you know eight hours or something yeah that's right and then that's typically where it happens is people trapped in an airplane with two or three sick people beside them and that yep. recirculated air unfiltered and so you've been inundated with that virus I, sorry i have to correct you on one thing yeah aircraft uh, filtration is extremely good okay very 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 good um the, the downside of the aircraft, 
in terms of the IAQ is that it's typically very dry. But there, it's, it's very well filtered and it's, I forget the exact number, but it's way higher air exchange rates than you'll find in a commercial building anywhere. Oh, good. Well, because I'm taking a holiday here and I'm going to be flying there. So I feel better already. Well, uh, I wouldn't, but that's me. Uh, <laughs> but I don't think you're crazy to do that. The, uh, the other thing is, and we do know that we've had some, one of the earlier spreading events was from being on an aircraft on a long haul flight. So the longer the flight, the more risk for obvious reasons. The other piece of this though is that was, nobody was wearing masks at that time and nobody was taking any precautions. Yeah. So, at this point, you're going to be wearing a mask. Everybody else is going to, well, except when they're eating and drinking. Right. Um, so they've lowered the risk significantly. But I wouldn't be concerned about the IAQ. I'd be concerned about, you know, being jammed in like a sardine with other sick people. Yeah, that's right. Well, they, they make you uh, take a, you have to prove that you're not ill three days before your flight. And yeah, you know, yeah. You have to wear the mask throughout the flight, except for eating. Here's the thing, everything's a trade-off on this stuff, right? That I, I don't think there's any question. The, the, the airlines have significantly lowered the risk. I don't understand personally that they're not keeping the empty seats. That, yeah. that's, I would not get on an aircraft if they weren't still doing the empty seat thing, yeah. personally. Yeah. Then again, I'm in a high risk category, so, and my risk you know, how I evaluate risk is different maybe than yeah. other. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm probably high risk as well. And hopefully before my plate, I'll be able to take the, the, uh, the antivirus and I'll be good to go. <laughs> That'd be good. Um, yeah. I mean, the, honestly, the other thing about flying somewhere for a holiday vacation, I'd be more concerned about getting to the airport, getting from the airport and where the heck I'm staying. Yes. Um, because if I was staying in a hotel, I wouldn't trust that hotel at all. No, we're staying at a, at a house and, and uh, the traveling, you find that if, if you ride with the windows open, you know, even cracked, uh, you have good ventilation that way. So you're not trapped in a car with a driver that you're not sure of. Right. I think we're looking and, and again, it's, it's all a numbers game, right? That's, that's, you can't make it zero risk. You can just manage the risk. That's right. And, and stay healthy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, that's it exactly. I mean, it's so bad that even I'm trying to get healthy again. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've yet to be able to touch my toes, but I'm going forward with it anyway. Uh, well, you're not still recording, I hope. Uh, no, I'm, I'm taking it off. 